Okay, well, I, I know um, this is a film you've been planning for some time, and Willem is a film you've been attached to for some time. Um, in dealing with a, a figure like Pasolini, whose life was so, in many ways, extensively documented, and he's such a mythologized figure by this point, why, why, could you talk a little bit about the decision to just focus on the last day or so of his life? <laughs> you know, with a guy like this, you could make a hundred thousand films. You know, I mean, you could talk about his life during the, um, you know, the German occupation, and, you know, leaving the small town that he lived in with his mother, starting in Rome, starting the Italian. You know, I mean, there's a, a constant flow, you know, and um, of, of, of thousands and thousands of movies to be made. And you know, those, his life is well documented. There never was a movie about him. You know, it was kind of skirt the issue. And you know, the last film, Giuliani's movie, right, was about, you know, it was basically about the cop. I mean, I didn't make a film about him. I was making a film about the detective who investigated the case. So, you know, to find, um, especially for the guy who's constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly moving forward, in the 90 minutes that we have is to find, lock in on a place he was at somewhere. Because if you got him up two weeks before, he's coming from another place, you know. Never mind he, three years before or eight years before. You know, so by locking on last day, we could focus in on the work he was doing that day. The two, you know, the beautiful scripts he was writing, the one we were filming, Pornote Peloso, he had another beautiful script about St. Paul. And, um, you know, I mean, why we chose the final day. I mean, it's something about, help me with this, you know, something about the death. You know, he speaks about this. If life is one long tracking shot, the death puts it into a perspective. And maybe that's why we went for it. Or maybe because we made 444 together and we found that, that, that kind of structure of, the end and working backwards from that. Let me see. Yeah, we chose that last day we did that. Talk about it today. No, I just did. I don't know. I, I don't remember how. It was really your idea, but it, how we arrived at it. But the nice thing about the last day is that's everything leads up to that. Um, if you know, you don't have to know about Pasolini to watch this movie, but if you know something about Pasolini, you can appreciate where he is at this moment because he has changed quite a bit. If you read his first novels about how he describes the, the boys of Rome and then you read in the Lutheran letters what he says about the boys of Rome, there's been quite a change. And he's, um, so this is really, in the, that present, the past is is all contained, and there's something nice about being able to anticipate what the future would have been, since we have a very hard ending because he was murdered. Could could you both talk a little bit about um, the the research process? I, I I gather that you you interviewed a lot of people. Me, I channeled by Michael Moore. <laughs> we went knocking on doors. Uh, you know, we did it. Like, you know, I mean, we've done a few documentaries, and then we, um, <clears throat> you know, we did our detective number on Strauss Kahn, so we just amped it up, you know. And um, we just, you know, our deal is we talked to everybody, man. We talked to everybody, from Pino Pelosi to the mayor of Rome to the, you know, the answer, to the whole gang, you know. I mean, I got the whole story. 20 different times, you know, it's Italy, man. You hear the same story 34 different ways. And we could take five minutes in New York, takes, you know, two hours in five minutes. But we listened and we sat and heard it, you know. And, um, and we, you know, we read all the stuff, man. We went back for it, you know. I mean, this was the, you know, this is the real, you know, the joy of the filmmaking, man. You know, you get back into it. You start seeing his movies again and reading it again, and, and you start, why am I digging on this guy? Why did I like this guy? Why why him, of all the guys? Why do I keep saying Salo is my favorite film? This film made me understand why, you know? And the further we went into the research, 
I mean, the more beautiful the cat was, you know. I mean, when you, especially talking to people who worked with him, who were young kids, he was the, he was the nicest to the, to the smallest people. No one had a bad word to say about him. I mean, never mind the poetry, the fucking political activism, the brilliant movies, the screenplays. You know, he's a pretty impressive dude. But in so, this in this process of reading and talking to people, did, were were there any surprises and revelations? Every day. I mean, but also, every day. and can you talk about how you know you said you had contradictory accounts? Like how how did you reconcile them? Contradictory accounts of what? You said you you heard this, you know different stories from different people. Well, I mean different stories about what what specific? Uh, well, I, I yeah, pick general, one out. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hard to say that's a general. Yeah, pick one out. Okay. Well, obviously, it went in. <laughs> With fast a figure like Pasolini, I think you had to talk about the end. The end, right? I knew you were going to say that. Well, okay. But, yeah. <laughs> how, many people, how many people they want to know about the day's death? And then, is it important? Yeah, is it important? Okay, you know the problem is gets get, so much importance is put on it. What were you talking about there for? The reason of how people relate to the death. That, you know. No, I would just say that if we focused on the death, it would eclipse everything else, and that's yeah. not the movie making other people have made that movie and I'd say at the beginning you particularly were very interested in that yeah, no, no, you kind of went through it and then uh, we deal with the death but uh, we don't uh, that's not what the movie's about you know when I'm making a documentary all right it's like I said this I don't go to the movies to find out who killed Jesse James I don't want to sign witness you know what I mean I'm going to cowboy movie Okay. We're making a movie and it's a process. Now, Pasolini had said, because he was going to write, a few weeks before this, he was going to write the name of the killer, Matei. Matei was like this mythical kind of business guy slash left-wing guy. And he was, he was assassinated. Death, death. They, you know, blew up his plane. And he was going to put the name of the guy in. And when he said, how do you know the name? But he says, hey, I'm not a detective, okay? I'm going to find out the name of that guy through my work as a writer, through my imagination. Okay, I asked the whole nine yards. We know the whole story about what happened that night. I'm gonna tell you, the same thing that happened on that beach at Driscalo is what happened in the hotel room with Dominique Strauss-Kahn. The only people who know the people were there. You know, whether they're still alive or not, it doesn't matter, okay? And there's no evidence going either way. You could look at it 14 different ways. In the same way I couldn't find out what happened a year ago in that room, I'm not gonna find out what happened 45 years ago doing detective work is they I'm not a detective, but I'm a filmmaker and he's an actor. And there's a process that him and I do. And that process is part of the making of the film. We reenacted that crime out there, okay? And the process that we used led us to this conclusion, okay? Now, am I gonna stand with my hand on the Bible in a Bible in a fucking courtroom and say that's what happened in that night? No, could that have been it? Absolutely. Is it the truth for this movie? Which again, is not a documentary on Pasolini either. This film is more about me than him, hopefully. It's more about him than him. Or maybe it's about the three of us in balance. I don't know what the deal, but it's some, you know, it's not just about him, and it's certainly not a documentary about him. And, you know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> All right. Fine. But if you wanted to, I mean, just because we're in New York and, and it's a film festival, there's one thing that is true that, that, that we know from our investigation, and that is if that car didn't roll over him, he would have lived. Okay? He died now because of that car going over him. Now, whether that kid did it who, or was a CIA agent or a KGB agent or a guy from P2 or the guy from the, you know, wherever. You know, whatever conspiracy theory you want to weave, was the guy behind that wheel, did he hit him intentionally, or was it just dark that night and he didn't know how to drive that Alpha and it just happened? But he went over him and the tragedy of the film is that this guy died at 53, which is 10 years younger than I am now. He was in the prime of his life. You know, the tragedy is not who killed him, the tragedy is, because finding out who killed him, you're not gonna bring him back, man. This dude is dead, you know, okay? And he is gone, okay? But the work that he could have done that, that was lost, that's the tragedy, man. Because you see that last shot of that book, that was his day book, man. 
they gave me that book. That was his day book. You see the way he wrote those, what he was going to do that day, what he was going to do the next day. Come on, that ain't a guy who's looking at, you know, thinking he's going to, he's going to die. I mean, I think he was the most surprised guy in the world when he died. Because his friends are figuring, what the hell, man? You know, because, you know, I mean, that was the guy's life at 1030 at night. It was sayonara, and everybody knew it. He was an out there gay dude. And in 1975, in that town, that wasn't so simple. That wasn't so easy, okay? Doing what he did, you know, he was no closet bullshit with this guy. He was out front. And the cats he was looking for, those kids at that station, some of those kids, 15, 16, were, you know, they weren't like these kids from Juilliard. You know, he wasn't looking for, like, a piano player from Juilliard. <laughs> you know, he needed that thing. He needed that, he really needed that, that thing. And he was looking for that thing, and that night he found it, you know. And... Uh, before we open it up, um, Willem, do you want to? I'd actually love to hear you talk a bit about your research process. It was it was pretty much the same as his, because <laughs> um, we really bounced stuff off of each other and really said, "Oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that?" Because so much of uh, working with the writer and working with Abel um, as an actor in this process was being turned on by things and, and saying, I think we should focus on this, because so much of the script was really made from things that were actually pulled, interviews, conversations, uh, things that were told uh, to us by in, uh, interviews with uh, family and friends. So that, uh, it was sort of gathering material, reading material, immersing myself in things, uh, Pasolini. Um, you know, the, so it was kind of like the work was the work of filmmaking. Uh, as far as actually playing him, of course you do whatever you need to do to feel confident, so you dye your hair black and you, uh, you know, get dark lenses and you try to look at like him a little bit, so you feel comfortable in that. You participate in the clothes, all that stuff, with the house and all that stuff. You start to make it your own, but most importantly, the idea was to try to inhabit and be clear about his ideas. Those interviews were really crucial. Um, and to understand those and try to imagine what his state of mind was, uh, was really my, was my work. Uh, we'll take some questions from there. Yes? Well, you know, the last movie I saw in a movie theater was Cat Chaser, the director's cut. And it was pretty amazing. I thought it was great. The um, is this movie the way you wanted it to be made, or were there this any one? compromises in this one? Do you think? Except when we everybody hear that. <laughs> Except when he came in the end. Now we it's yeah, it's all film. You know, I mean, Cat Chaser was a film. That was the last film we did where we didn't have final cut. You know, and um, it was also a film that we, we 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 left, man. You know, I mean, I left that film because it was either that or you know commit murder, you know, there's the people who murdered that film, and they destroyed that film, and, you know, is this my film? You bet it's my film. Yeah. Any film I'm going to put my name on, it's going to be our film, my film, his film, you know, but this is the film we wanted, that we wanted to end up with. I don't know if it's the one we wanted to make, but it was the one we wanted to show now, and, I mean, that's just where it's at, because, and, you know, for that, we, you know, at this point, we started in L.A., and moved east for, you know, just to have the creative process back. And we moved east again. I don't know, we might have to move east again. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know where I'm going to end up. Timbuktu, well, it's not, it's, I'm probably east of Timbuktu. But we're going to, you know what I'm saying. But the bottom line is, as a director, your gig, I mean, my gig in the end is to protect that film. You know, really, to protect the work of all of us. And if I can't do that, then I shouldn't even call myself a director. You know, and if you don't go into this without, with final cut, without final cut, without the final, you know, work, man, I mean, you're wasting your time, really, as a filmmaker. And you're wasting everybody's time that you're working with. Because, you know, the reality is every, every shot counts, every frame counts, every beat of music, every effect, it's all, you know, and you know, you know, to see that catch, I said, you just saw a rough cut the editor made, which is a billion times better than whatever. You know, it breaks your heart, but I'm, you know, 
you know, I'm not going to get in situations where I'm going to, you know what I mean, get my heart broken. You know, my heart gets broken. I break my own heart. I don't need to go in a situation that I know I'm going to get, you know, blasted in the heart, you know. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about working with Nanetta Udenholi a little bit, given his uh, closeness to these events. I'll just repeat in case people didn't hear the question. It's about working with Nanetta uh, Udenholi. Uh, Dabli, Dabli, Dabli. Nanetta Udenholi. Yeah. <coughs> you know, yeah, I mean, you know, it was interesting because he came to us basically the first time. He came to us as his friend. He said to me, hey, man, I'm here because I want to know what you guys are doing, basically. He came to, as his friend, talking about protecting his friend. This is 45 years later. This dude comes searching us out. I want to know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. He's an actor. He, he works in the town. But he came at it with big time respect for him. He did big time. Big time. Knowing who I was, a little, okay, what's going on? We sat and laid the whole script out for him. Remember that lunch? I came, I came blazing because I knew we'd go to his restaurant with him sitting there. You know, when we came with the writer, with the editor, he, he left, he says, you already have an editor? You didn't make the film yet. But, you know, we came all prepped. But he's, you know, you can do all the research in the world, but you want to know about Pasolini, put a camera in his actor's face, man. You know, direct this guy and be with the guy and feel the guy. And, and, and you know, this is, this is why the process is so, it's so powerful, you know, and why I do it, you know, because it's, it, 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 it just, you can't express it. And the guy, I mean, in the end, he gave us his clothes. You know, it's funny because when he was all ready to do it, I was thinking, oh, all these people are going to be so, because I, 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 I would imagine in my mind, what if I went and saw somebody dressed totally like my father in my father's clothes, going to play, I would be in tears, right? When Inetto saw him, perfectly ready to go with the first day shooting, he started laughing so hard. Right? <laughs> and killed us. The fuck this guy should be crying, man. You know, but he's laughing at him. You know, it's the big first day of shooting, he's laughing already. I said, oh my God. But he takes it out. This, this was a beautiful moment. I had somebody, I think, got it on their phone. He took out this thing out of his pocket and took this, this medal that Pierre Paolo wore all the time and put it around his neck. Mm. I just, he was really supportive, and uh, that helps. Yeah. Also, working with uh, Adrian Aske, uh, who, who was a good friend of uh, Pasolini, and had worked with him, that helped as well. And his cousin was played by the lovely Giada Colagrande in this movie. <laughs> his wife, and the um, real director. <laughs> She was She's she was on the set, particularly in the uh, scenes at the house, to really just kind of saying, oh, that's not quite right," or you know, we'd listen to her. She wasn't the end of the you know, she wasn't the final word. But these people helped guide us, and they, you know, our family became their family, and that's not a bad source to have. It you know keeps you um, you know confident and open. Uh, two questions. Uh, the importance of Laura Betty, um, and the second is uh, the fertility rite. Why is it in the film? Well, <laughs> Abel. Laura Betty is important, but, um, you know, in that, uh, one nice thing about having that uh, structure of basically that last day is we had a scenario that was basically built on fact. Mm -hmm. so those were the bones, and then we had to figure out what we had from that. And there was this lunch, and uh, Laura Betty uh, showed up, and uh, that was, you know, she was a uh, she was a close friend. So it's not something you want to develop too much. Uh, yeah, she was the, you know, it's like this guy has like compartmentalized. He had his mother, he had his mother, he's living with his mother, okay? So he could be like, oh my God, I'm living with my mother. No, he loved his mother, he adored his mother, he was everything to his mother, his mother was everything to him. He had that scene. But he had his crazy show business friends, and he brought them home. 
and they had lunch. And his mother wasn't so crazy about Lower Betty, but too bad. There's my, you know, he had the business at home. Yeah, Dobbley would come to the house, okay? They, they would do that, you know, that life that he lived. He had the, the intellect, he had Moravia, he had the, the dinners, he had his film thing, he had his work, he had his life pretty much decked out. Those guys were making a lot of money back then, man. Those films were all playing in New York. There was a big market for his work. His cousin who was, you know, you see him in the thing talking business with him, telling me they would write synopses, send him to L.A. and get, they would get strong bread, man. That film industry was rolling. A film industry that he helped create with Fellini, with Rossellini, with their DPs, Della Coley, De Palma, the whole gang. I mean, this was like, the, they were 